I am pleased to welcome Tirthankar Roy. He is a scholar and teaches at the London School of Economics, where he is a professor of history. But he has written for us in this series edited by me, the story of the East India Company. And I just want to, to f show you the subtitle, which is the world's most powerful corporation. How this came about, how a company became a ruler in the world, how it survived for almost 300 years is an amazing story. And that's what we are going to talk about today. This book of the Tankas is part of a set, a set of now 11 volumes, 10 of them come in this nice lovely red box. One of the things I learned from this book was how the wearing of underwear began with the East India Company's discovery of fine cotton in India, which they took to Europe and the first the aristocracy could afford it and they began wearing underwear for the first time in history and after that it was the middle classes and then of course in the 20th century the masses, everybody. So the fact that you are wearing underwear goes back to the discovery of fine cotton textiles from India by the East India Company. So Tirthankar, how did the East India Company get started? Well, it started in 1600 um, at a time when merchants in England were very keen to uh, get their hands on Asian goods, uh, mainly spices. Textiles were still not quite in the picture, but they knew about textiles and they knew about um, a number of other products that originated in India and which, which had a great demand in Europe. But the obstacles to creating a trading company and uh, trading regularly with uh, the Indian Ocean um, areas were huge. And they needed to come together, pool their capital together. Right. And they had a prehistory of this. They had the Levant Company, which had started before that. And right. uh, they knew the idea of joint stock company and, uh, and reducing risks by so, collective enterprise. So you're, you're on to the, the, the idea of why was this company so amazingly successful. And one of the things you just started explaining was the fact that the idea of joint stock, it was one of the first joint stock companies in the world and this allowed risk to be distributed amongst a large number of people as well as liability limited because it was a legal entity on its own right and therefore an ind one individual did not have to gamble everything should it fail. Absolutely, uh, but we also have to uh, factor in the fact that um, wh why, why did you need to pull in capital? Because capital was needed not just for trade, but also for um, fighting battles with European rivals, um, having gunships which are expensive, creating settlements in the seaboards uh, in unknown territories which had to be defended. Uh, so conflicts. the need for guns and uh, war was because of the rivalry between the European countries, not because the rest of the world was a hostile place, was it? Not necessarily. I mean, what, they, what the English and the Dutch were trying to do in India, um, for example, which had established powerful states of, of, their own, of its own, uh, was diplomacy rather than uh, fighting their way in. Yeah, um, and there was a trade on in the Indian Ocean yeah, before exactly. the Europeans arrived, right. and that was a fairly peaceful yes. trade. Yes. So the and most the wars, I mean, you were right. I mean, most battles, most wars uh, happening on the Indian Ocean were between Europeans in the 1600s. Right, and particularly the Portuguese and Absolutely. In English in, when yeah. it came to India. Yeah. Uh, well, the English fought with the Dutch as well, but they, they kind of uh, kept each other at arm's length, not getting too involved in battles because they were very similarly, um, similar strengths. So explain to me 
How did a trading company, which came to buy and sell and become rich and had shareholders, a joint stock company, become a political power? I think there could be two reasons behind it. Uh, there's evidence for both. Um, one of them is that, um, uh, is that uh, the Mughal Empire was collapsing in the 18th century. And given that the European companies had military strength, they had military power already, they were a valuable ally to some of the successor states, and they were trying to cut deals with them, join us. Mm. Um, so that's one way that a trading company could get involved. The other way, very different way, is that um, they, these companies uh, ran their business on the basis of long-term contracts and very large-scale contracts. In, in the absence of a proper contract law or courts of law which could respect those uh, rules. And any trading power in this world would think that by having state power, trade will be helped. Well, it's a big leap, isn't it? It is. We don't think of multinational companies these days mm -hmm. running governments and running... Uh, I mean, it's a bizarre episode. It is indeed, yes. Um, and as you said before, um, I mean, the company was a joint stock company, so it was very modern in that sense. Yeah. But uh, this trading world where violence is part of doing trade is not modern. So it's a mix. So you could call it a transitional time when violence uh, or military power was, naval power was needed for success in trade. And you know, another point that, we, we, that you make in this book, of course, is that while contracts are important and they should be enforced, uh, commercial contracts, but the world has been dealing in trade terms on the basis of trust. Trust is the key. Uh, you are absolutely right. But uh, if the scale of trade grows um, much larger, if the parties don't know each other very well to know whether they are trustworthy or not, then you need law mm. and you need courts. Yeah, and that's a uh, point that you make very well in your book, Dear Thankar, that one of the reasons why Bombay got a competitive advantage over Surat and other ports of India is because the British provided the enforcement of law in the in, in 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 Bombay, and people felt comfortable, uh, both Indians as well as the rest of the people who came to trade from around the world. That's right. I mean, I, I would only qualify that that we are talking here about commercial law. Yeah. I mean, there was rule of law everywhere. Right. Uh, but there were different type of rule of law. Yeah. It's the commercial law that yeah. we are we are talking about. So, one of the things that frankly revolted me, yeah. while I read this story is the fact that the British government created a monopoly yeah. they, and they guaranteed that monopoly mm. with the sovereign power of the British government. Now it feels very odd that first of all monopolies are bad and second, monopolies guaranteed by the government are even worse. And, of course, Adam Smith fought yes. against you, it, didn't you, he? You were in good company, yes. <laughs> um, indeed. I mean, by the ed end of the 18th century, the monopoly guaranteed by the government was a very controversial idea. More, there were more critiques than more people in support. However, it was quite different around 1600 when the charter was first uh, drawn. Um, most joint stock companies um, trading in the uh, in transoceanic uh, uh, setting would want a charter, and uh, they were given a charter. Uh, part of that game was the difference between the crown and the parliament in Britain. Uh, the crown gave the charter, mm. and the crown expected to get some money out of this. Mm. Um, the parliament didn't like the charter, but mm. but it was a privilege that was given to the crown. It was kind of kind of give and take. But part of the game was also that um, um, trade joined with exploration, trade joined with massive risk-taking, trade was an uncertain game because if you are negotiating with a foreign uh, ruler, you don't want hundreds of people to negotiate. You want one chief negotiator. Correct. So the idea of monopoly charter came from uh, the fact that it needed to be managed 
and managed by giving a part of state power to these companies. Well, you know, I read somewhere one of the last chartered companies yes. of Britain today is the BBC. BBC. <laughs> <laughs> and, and frankly, uh, Adam Smith played a very powerful role in breaking the monopoly yes. of the East India Company. And East India Company suffered a real jolt um, uh, after that. You are right. Uh, yeah, although the critique was more theoretical than practical, uh, I mean, he used the example of the company to create a larger argument that monopolies are bad, right. competition is good. However, the company's own monopoly was under attack from rival traders for yes. a very long time. And yeah. the company was basically losing that game. Yes, and also with the Industrial Revolution, uh, Britain became more of an exporter yeah. of cotton textiles to India rather than an importer. And that changed the role of the company because the real value added went to the mills of Manchester and Lancashire. Indeed. With the Industrial Indeed. Revolution. Yes. And the interesting part about this is that there was, the, 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 with the decline, the early decline of the East India Company, Tirthankar shows began in the 18th century, early 18th century, but they got a second wind with, the, with China and the fact that the English began to like tea yeah. from China. Now they needed to pay for that tea as you've explained, and they had then to that opium, the export of opium from India. So that's the second part of the story of the East India Company, isn't it? Yes, indeed. And, and, and so I wanted to ask you, it is not only what I've learned from you is that it's not only the world's most powerful corporation, but in fact, it went on to become a model mm. of the modern multinational corporation. The MNC really became the, it was inspired in a way mm. by the, some of the methods of management used by the East India Company. Absolutely. I mean, you, you talked about um, joint stock company and the limited liability principle. Correct. Uh, apart from these uh, legal definitions or legal framework, there was also the idea that uh, a, a transoceanic firm with a head in London and head office in London and branches spread out 10,000 miles um, radius uh, will need to sort out the problem of uh, how principals control their agents. Correct. And uh, you need to draw up contracts. Right. You need to have a penalty and uh, incentive system. Right. So some of these ideas also evolved out of this experience. Exactly. And, and for someone like me who actually worked many years in Indeed. a multinational yes. company, I realized while reading your book that some of the same questions we faced mm. um, when I was working, the headquarters control versus autonomy yes. for the subsidiary, these were questions they were discussing yes. at that time. The notion of a hierarchy and the accountability mm. of the managers. And, and if, I, if I may add that, um, the, the local branches had a different knowledge set about markets, about supplies, than the head offices. And, and you know, the other point you mentioned about the fact that what made a company like East India Company different from other traders was that it didn't focus only on spot purchases mm. in the ports, but built long-term contracts with weavers yeah. and with the middlemen so that there could be guaranteed yes. uh, regular supply. Anyway, um, we don't have more time, unfortunately. So thank you again, Tirthanka, you. Uh, and we shall talk to you soon.